we're on. So hi, Rupert. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and the idea of this short conversation is to kind of give a bit of a preamble to our upcoming residency on the 24th of March, which you'll be facilitating, which is uh, making eco-spirituality accessible. And um, yeah, for those of our viewers and listeners who aren't aware of who you are, would you mind just giving a, a short introduction about yourself? Sure. So I'm a prof at the University of East Anglia in England. Uh, I teach uh, many things, including uh, Wittgenstein, uh, philosophy of religion, philosophy of the social sciences, uh, philosophy of film. Um, I've been active for many years as a green campaigner in various ways. For example, uh, I was an elected councillor with the Green Party uh, in uh, a previous period. Um, more recently, I've been very involved with Extinction Rebellion. I was one of the uh, main spokespeople and, and strategists. I'm now no longer involved with uh, with XR and I'm focusing primarily on trying to create a broader climate mobilization, uh, which I call the moderate flank, to exploit the space that XR and the school climate strikers have successfully uh, opened up. Uh, and I'm also um, connected with that, um, seeking to deepen the work that I've already done in the past and published on on uh, eco-spirituality, on the fundamentals of the kind of paradigm shift that we need in the difficult world that we're going into. This is part of the task of, uh, of adaptation that we need to make to the extremely challenging future opening up before us. Uh, sometimes I call it spiritual adaptation. So maybe you could go briefly into explaining what eco-spirituality is and what that means. Yeah, so eco-spirituality is spirituality which is explicitly connected with our residency of the earth. Um, it has a, a very long um, background or prehistory, if you will, um, because arguably... Um, as far as we can tell, much of the earliest uh, spirituality uh, that there has been has been uh, eco-spirituality. Um, people um, living a long, long time ago uh, felt themselves to be deeply connected with the earth, arguably much more deeply connected than many of us feel today. And that's the whole point in a way. That's the whole problem. So this is as much about uh, going back as about going forwards, if you will. It's about uh, recapturing something that we've lost, uh, an intrinsic sense of connection uh, with the earth, an intrinsic sense of the earth's uh, sacredness uh, and absolute uh, necessity, uh, a greater sense of humility, uh, of humbleness. This is something which I think we've very much lost um, as we have become more um, agricultural and in particular industrial. Uh, and as we've seemed to have greater and greater power uh, over the earth, I emphasize the, the words seemed to uh, there, because, of course, what we're finding is that, that actually the earth is exceeding um, our puny attempts at uh, control and uh, coming back to bite us. So this might be a, a good moment at which to reconsider um, our relationship with, uh, with where we are, where we stand. So a long time ago, it looks like uh, much spirituality was uh, was animistic. Uh, it saw all of uh, of nature as being infused with life, all um, infused with spirit. Um, or um, perhaps after that, uh, pantheistic or panentheistic, uh, seeing um, the uh, the whole of nature as God or as containing uh, God. Um, uh, or the great spirit, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and as I say, that's something which we need to try to reconnect with uh, if we are to actually succeed in uh, in going forward. Um, and that's obviously a critical reason for thinking about eco-spirituality at this time. Uh, my belief is that our crisis is, is obviously deeper than merely being a hugely deep... Um, crisis of our political economy, uh, a crisis of our uh, ecology, of our relation uh, with the earth in a, in a physical 
uh, sense. It's about how we we think about uh, the earth and how we comport ourselves with regard uh, to it. What our relation is uh, to it. Are we coming at this as uh, overlords or as uh, humble co-creators or as uh, tiny uh, would-be uh, stewards? Um, this, these are the kinds of questions which we'll be touching on in the early part of the uh, of the residency. Uh, which is uh, which is designed to uh, help us to engage in more of this kind of deep reconnection, uh, to explore uh, relations to uh, the earth which are closer to uh, animism or to pantheism than perhaps what we've been used to. And as I say, it seems to me just stark, staringly obvious now that if we're really going to uh, get through what is coming and ad adapt to uh, what is coming. And if we're going to do so in a way which is adequate, which rises to the, the challenge which our times have laid down, then we're talking paradigm change. We're talking a change in our entire uh, attitude to, uh, to ourselves and to the universe. Um, and that, in, in its largest sense, is what uh, eco-spirituality uh, aims to foster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there, and it's so relevant to our to our time and, and the crisis that we're facing. And I'm just curious, like how how do you see eco spirituality as um kind of like a pragmatic tool as well for for people in our time, like maybe climate activists and uh, certain other groups of people? How can they kind of embody eco spirituality in their day to day? Yeah, very good. This is something we'll be thinking about in the residency and something something we'll be thinking about, especially in the last week or two of the residency, as we look sort of to emerging from it, as it were, back into uh, uh, the world. Um, in my opinion, and it's not just my opinion, as you'll know, um, there is a deep need for activists and for any who are seeking to engage in wide world change to have some kind of inner resource, to have some kind of inner work going on, to have some kind of practice which can help to guard them against burnout, which can help to guard them, to guard us uh, uh, against um, overindulgence in ego, against this becoming all about us as uh, as individuals or, or our projects or... Um, whatever, you know, our uh, damaged uh, childhoods that we're somehow trying to make right through our activist uh, work. Uh, and that can and that can guard us uh, against the very real uh, dangers of um, our activist work becoming kind of unmoored for what, from what it needs to be, uh, drifting off into a sort of uh, psychodrama, getting taken over perhaps, by uh, emotions which are which are troublesome, difficult to manage. Emotions like rage, for example, you know, it's quite reasonable to feel rage in relation to what's happening in the world, but you've got to be careful with rage. I'm not at all somebody who thinks, oh, some of these emotions that we feel in relation to what what's uh, hitting us are bad. We must uh, suppress them. We must uh, move beyond them. I don't think that at all. I think that rage is is literally vital. I think that fear is literally vital. Um, I, I, one of the things we'll be talking about in the residency is how vital it is not to have a dualistic attitude, not to say those emotions are, uh, are the negative ones, we'll push those away and we'll go for the positive ones like love and joy. Um, but um, there's a reason why people are uh, afraid of, uh, of fear and afraid of rage, uh, and that is that they can uh, run away uh, with one. Uh, and they can become harmful. Um, for example, if they encourage an excessive dualistic attitude of us and them, uh, rather than, than trying to find the sense in which we really are, in a certain sense, all in this together. So, yeah, the, the, there's a real need for, for inner work. We'll be seeking to do some of that uh, inner work and provide, in that sense, a, a sort of uh, assistance, ongoing assistance to ourselves, to anyone uh, engaged in uh, the process of trying to seek social and ecological uh, transformation. Um, and in this sense, I, I do believe very strongly 
uh, that um, inner work and outer work have to go together, that they're two sides of the same coin. Uh, I've experienced, I've known this truth at some deep level for many years, but I've also for many years been involved in activism in a way that I think didn't uh, realize this truth enough. Uh, and I think many of us have the same experience of either sort of um, drifting into a sort of excessively kind of inward version of spirituality, which is essentially about a kind of self-improvement and involves what uh, Chogyam Trumpa calls uh, spiritual materialism, uh, or into being tempted because the problems are so urgent to focus everything increasingly on the on the outer uh, and not make use of this of these inner resources and not not bring the two together. You know that's a lot of what we'll be trying to do in in discussing the the form of uh, of the kind of movements we need going forward. Thinking about how these things really are two sides of the same coin, how uh, a deeper engagement and immersion. Uh, in uh, broadly eco-spiritual perspectives um, can be a crucial part uh, of actual um, uh, activism. And, you know, Nathan, one of the things that really uh, gives me hope in these dark times is that there is a real upsurge of eco-spirituality or what's sometimes called dark green religion going on uh, around the world. It is real. Um, and that is going to be a vital resource for the activism and the action uh, that we need. Uh, and that's what we seek to further midwife through this residency. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a brilliant opportunity for those who, who come and join you at the residency. Unfortunately, I won't be able to join because I'm here in Bali. Mm -hmm. We will be having occasional. We will be having occasional um, moments where we reach out broadly, more broadly, into the world via Zoom. Uh, possibly you can join one of those. But yeah, the key thing is going to be to be there. Those those occasions, if they occur, will be the rare exception. The main thing is going to be that we're going to be a small group of uh, really remarkable um, people, judging by those who have applied to come so far. Uh, and yeah, it's it's very exciting in that way. Yeah. And I think what's so great about the residencies is, you know, you come together not just for for the workshop, like a small amount of time, but it's a it's a, be a period of time. It's almost um, one month, I believe, this residency is. And um, so I was curious, how do you think that sense of community, which which can be fostered over the month, is um, such an integral part of of the residencies? Yeah, well, so this is going to be my first experience of uh, of this uh, this centre, which I'm enormously looking forward to. Uh, I've been talking about it with Liam Kavanagh and others for some time, but I do have experience of similar uh, things elsewhere. Uh, and yeah, I think we're very aware going into this residency that there is a very real opportunity to seek to model and experiment with some of the very things that we're talking about through the process of being there together. In community uh, for a month. In this way, we're hoping that it's going to be, uh, and we're planning on it being um, prefigurative, uh, potentially uh, transformative, uh, actually doing um, some of the work that uh, needs to be done, not just uh, talking about it. Um, and uh, like uh, Liam, I'm um, one of my absolute main influences is Buddhism. I'm a regular Buddhist meditator, etc. I've studied with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and, and others. Um, and um, of course, in Buddhism, uh, there are these, uh, these three uh, refuges. You take refuge in the Buddha, you take refuge in the Dharma, in the truth, in the teachings. And you take refuge in the Sangha, in the community, the, the community of, uh, of spirit. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing about Buddhism. It's not just Buddhism, of course. Many other um, spiritual traditions have something similar. Uh, but I love the way that Buddhism puts it kind of right up there. So, yeah, we'll be seeking to uh, co-create and um, uh, expand upon the the aspects of Sangha that already uh, exist uh, through um, uh, through the Life Itself uh, network and through the, through the pre-existing networks of those who are going to uh, be there. But above all, it will be uh, co-created uh, in person uh, there in France. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be very exciting at the residency. Um, 
So I think I'd just like to scroll back because you said like one of your key interests and key inspirations at the moment is uh, the moderate flank. Would you like to just explain a bit about that and how that relates to eco-spirituality as well? Yeah. So we're going to be talking about this probably towards the latter end of the uh, residency. The idea of the moderate flank is that Extinction Rebellion was set up explicitly to be a radical flank to the existing green and climate movement, explicitly to push the envelope. And my argument would be it succeeded in doing that. As a result, a new space, I think, has been opened up. And what's needed now badly is for that space to be occupied. Uh, and I'm working with people in, in business, in workplaces, in communities who are trying to do just that. And we're going to be exploring the potential for that kind of new mass distributed movement uh, and it's relevant to eco-spirituality in a number of ways so the first and probably most important way uh, is that this eco-spiritual perspective um, is a perspective which is ruthlessly realistic uh, about the situation uh, that we're in about the way the extent to which for example the earth has been already uh, degraded um, this is a very grounded spirituality. This is not uh, um, off with the fairies, as it were, thinking um, uh, anything is possible. You just have to set your mind to it and you can sort of alter reality. No, reality is conceptualized here as, as very real. Um, but um, our power in relation to it is also conceptualized as potentially uh, uh, very great in the sense that there is so much that we can do. There is so much that becomes possible. Uh, if we allow ourselves to be grounded in the earth, to be grounded in love, to be grounded in and with and through uh, each other. So eco-spirituality, as we've been saying earlier, is um, focal to, central to the new paradigm uh, that we need. Uh, uh, and that new paradigm, I think, informs a lot of what um, these emerging groups are doing. So for to take an example, a group uh, that I've been involved with setting up, a little group called Transformative Adaptation, um, is uh, very aware, it's based on the idea uh, that we're going to have to uh, adapt much more than we have so far, because it's too late to prevent dangerous climate change. It's here, and it's going to get worse for, for a long time to come. So in relation to a, an element of the emerging moderate flank like that, like transformative adaptation, and I'll say something similar with regard to the, the climate emergency centres that are now springing up, for example, um, a, 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 an eco-spiritual um, realism um, is kind of built into the very nature of the, uh, of the organisation. So that's one dimension. Another dimension is that, as we were saying earlier, uh, it is crucial that going forward, um, we have um, inner work and outer work tied together, that we have uh, activism, which is not just focused on trying to change the world, but understands the importance of uh, accepting uh, and of uh, changing yourself uh, as well. Um, and the kind of spirituality, the kind of inner work that we need for this some of it will be sort of basic kind of mindfulness but some of it ideally would be kind of explicitly co-spiritual in orientation in other words the kind of uh, change that we're going to get um, if we ground ourselves um, in the earth um, the kind of psycho-spiritual change we're going to get um, well it's going to be more profound uh, and as we were saying earlier it's going to be less inclined to fall back into uh, into egocentrism. I mean, it's ecocentrism, not egocentrism, in the cute little phrase that is sometimes used. Uh, then there's another dimension still, uh, the, the, the final dimension, perhaps, of the way in which the, the moderate flank and eco-spirituality are relevant to each other. And it's this, that as I see the moderate flank, it takes form primarily through the most crucial ways in which we live. Uh, that's um, the ways we spend most of our time, where we live uh, and where we work. So businesses and workplaces uh, and real geographic communities. But that's not all there is. There are other important aspects of our life uh, as well, um, such as the other organisations um, uh, that we belong to, uh, the other ways in which we try to make change. 
So those include, for example, political organisations, but they also obviously include religious and spiritual organisations. In other words, we need to think um, eco-spirituality and, moder- and the moderate flank in relation specifically to each other, because one of the ways that we're going to get through what's coming, um, because we need everything, one of the ways that we're going to get through what's coming, if we are, um, is through changing religious and spiritual organisations in a more ecological uh, direction. Um, and that, I think, should be part of the work of the, of the so-called uh, moderate flank, that we need to get um, uh, Catholics uh, and uh, Buddhists um, and everybody who in any way sees um, what they do as religious or spiritual, we need to get them um, on board with thinking about how their organisations uh, and their teachings even uh, need to shift uh, to to fit um, the uh, our our times, which uh, are times badly in need of eco spirituality, uh, and maybe to go forward together in the, the sort of kind of way that the moderate flank approach um, uh, imagines. So a number of different dimensions, a number of different ways in which um, the idea of eco spiritually and the idea of the moderate flank uh, deserve to be explored in relation to each other, uh, and we're going to do some of that exploring. Uh, probably towards the end of the residency, as we perhaps contemplate how to emerge back into the world and uh, uh, and make it even more beautiful than it already is. Mm. Yeah, great. And so, for for people who uh, may be attending the residency, but also for people who aren't, is there uh, any good resources you would suggest where they could learn about the moderate flank and about eco spirituality, either in preparation or as a as a standalone resource? Yeah, so we already have um, several things um, linked to uh, on the Life Itself page uh, about the uh, the residency. So that'd be the best place to to go. Um, if you want more, then I think uh, Mrs. Google is a good uh, tool. Um, so you can uh, you can Google um, uh, moderate flank uh, and stuff will will come up uh, quite well. Now Google it in quotes. Uh, there's also quite a lot of stuff on uh, my own personal site www.rupertreed.net great yeah i'll uh, link that down below as well so i think um i think that kind of brings it to a close i think we've covered uh eco spirituality in the moderate flat flank and um yeah thank you so much for for jumping on this call and having this conversation and uh is there anything else you'd like to share before we we kind of close well, no, thank you, Nathan, and uh, and thank you for watching. And if I were to say anything in closing, it would just be very simple. It would be, if you can come, uh, do come. Uh, obviously, we appreciate it's a long way and a lot of time, but there's nothing more important than this. So consider joining us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so for everyone listening, that's um, the 24th of March at the Life Itself Practice, Praxis Hub in uh, Bergerac, France. And there'll be a link below where you can apply and learn more. So thank you, Rupert, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you soon, hopefully, and enjoy the residency.